So he's going to send his guys to cut them off then? No. But, but that's an order, isn't it? What's he going to do instead? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Get the glory. Right. Wait, wait, wait. No. Does disobeying orders really get glory? Uh-huh. Okay. See you next week. Yeah. May 27th, 1944. They've been there since January. Sitting around. Fighting. Sitting around again fighting again, the Allied forces at Anzio, and the Germans opposite them have been strong enough to hold them down, but not strong enough to drive them away. But this week, this week the men at Anzio finally break out. I'm Indy Nidell. This is World War II. Last week in Italy, the Allies took mighty Monte Cassino and broke through the German Gustav Line in force. Merrill's marauders broke through in Burma and took the Michina airfield, but they could not take the town itself. In China, the Japanese had broken through and laid siege to Luoyang. And at Impal, the British broke through at Potsang Bang, but failed at Bishanpur. After the brutal fighting at Bishanpur and the entrance to the Impal Plain last week, David Cowan's 17th Indian Infantry Division has to call in the 20th Division this week for help to get his guys out of a very sticky situation. Especially his Gurkhas in 48th Brigade really slug it out the first half of the week by Torbung. But with the reinforcements, Nobuo Tanaka's Japanese 33rd Division is now seriously outnumbered and they are just wiped out over the rest of this week and the first half of next. They don't have the numbers or the equipment, and Valor alone cannot win the day. British commander Bill Slim, who is no fan of the Japanese, even has this praise for his enemy. There can have been few examples in history of a force as reduced, battered, and exhausted as the 33rd Japanese Division delivering such furious assaults, not with the object of extricating itself, but to achieve its original offensive intention. Tanaka will withdraw what's left here, the 30th, but he will still hold his front, though his men have reached the point of starvation. The week ends with his forces still in possession of Ningthao Kong, despite heavy British attacks all week. Meanwhile, up at Kohima, the British bring in fresh troops from the 7th Indian Division and attack the Japanese center from the 24th and into next week. But spoiler, they are repulsed after bloody and brutal fighting. Japanese commander up there, Katoku Sato, has had it with his superiors. His men too are starving, and he's pretty certain that 15th Army is not gonna send him any stuff. So on the 25th, he tells them he is going to withdraw June 1st unless he gets some supplies. Merrill's marauders have, on the other hand, been supplied. They took Michina Airfield last week. This is actually a big deal, for this immediately makes flying the hump route to China with supplies a whole lot easier. So Chinese nationalist leader Chiang Kai-shek is going to get a lot more stuff a lot quicker over the next few months if they can hold the airfield. But with the buildup of Japanese at Michina itself, Allied Commander Vinegar Joe Stilwell is worried. So he asks Chindit Commander Walter Lentain to order Mike Calvert's brigade to take Mogaung, which would relieve some pressure. See, Shinichi Tanaka's plans have been unhinged by the marauders' trek over the Kumon Mountains to Michina. His orders are to hold Mogaung, and he has one division and two battalions against several times that number of enemy coming down the Kamaing Road. But he's thought that as long as he can hold in front of Mogaung, Michina would be safe. And once the monsoons come in June, no armor will be able to get through. But the end run over the mountains has wrecked that. Well, today on the 27th, Mad Mike Calvert gets the order for his chindits to take Mogaung. He says he can do the job by June 5th. One job that is finished this week is the Japanese capture of Luoyang. The old Chinese capital falls the 25th. Japan's Kaikan Offensive, part one of Operation Ichigo, is coming to its end. The Japanese have destroyed the Chinese forces along the southern Peking Hankou Railway and around Luoyang. And with a brigade advancing northward from further south along the railway, they've linked northern and southern forces at Xishan and actually cleared the Peking Hankou Railway. The next phase is the Shokai Offensive, with 11 Corps heading south along the Shang River towards Changsha. On the 26th, the Japanese strike into Hunan. 
General Hideki Tojo, Army Chief of Staff, reported to the Emperor that the Nationalist Army did not understand the objectives of Ichigo. However, by this time Chiang Kai-shek and Chu Yongcheng had arrived at a correct assessment of Japanese intentions. Nonetheless, they underestimated the combat effectiveness and the determination of the Japanese. This mistake lay behind their failure to take adequate countermeasures. Yesterday and today, the Japanese 11th Army advance hits the flanks of the nationalists starting the battle in Hunan. More on this next week. For there are advances in Italy I need to talk about this week. The Allies are advancing in the Leary Valley and in the mountains to the west. On the 23rd, the Allies also begin their breakout from Anzio. More than 150,000 men break out of the perimeter that they've been stuck in for four months and will hopefully link up with the advancing main body of 5th Army. They attack Cisterna, taking heavy casualties but making gains. Advanced units of 2nd Corps reach Terracina to their south. They occupy it the next day. And the Canadians take Ponte Corvo, and their 5th Armored Division reaches the Melfa River. The Anzio breakout attacks continue the 24th and reach Highway 7 near Latina. The obvious next move from here is towards Velletri and Valmontone, and if this is executed quickly, most of the German 10th Army may be cut off. Kesselring therefore sends his only remaining reserve, the Hermann Goering Division, to join the forces in the sector. General Clark, commanding 5th Army, only keeps one division moving forward in this sector, and despite direct orders from Alexander, puts his principal effort into capturing the glory of freeing Rome. Harold Alexander is Allied Armies in Italy commander. Well, Mark Clark does feel that if he heads north to Valmontone, he'll expose his left flank to a possible counterattack from the Alban Hills. He also doesn't think they will necessarily trap the Germans by blocking the highway, as there are secondary routes further inland. But he is primarily worried that if he engages at Valmontone, the British will slip past and they will enter Rome not his army. Clark has now mainly, but not entirely, ignored a direct order from Alexander. To Churchill, watching with fascination from a distance, this seemed outrageous. It also seemed outrageous to Truscott and other US commanders, and most British generals shared the view. If Clark had closed the trap, possibly the Germans might not have escaped. No one can say. The only certainties are that this was not a high water mark in Anglo-American military relations and that the bulk of the German forces from the casino area sidestepped the Allies and got away. Well, on the 25th, the main 6th Corps attacks take Cisterna and Cori, and patrols from 2nd Corps link up with them, so they now have a unified front. In the Leary Valley, the Allies take Monte Cairo, Piedimonte, and Aquino, but because of Clark's strategy, 14th Panzer Corps Commander Fridolin von Zenger can set up strong resistance near Arce and Ceprano, allowing his forces to pull back to the Caesar defense line. There are plans afoot to break through the German lines elsewhere. I talked at the end of last week about the Soviet plans for a big new offensive against German Army Group Center called Operation Bagration. This is to go off a bit less than a month from now. The buildup has been going on since the beginning of the month. The Soviets have managed to focus Axis attention south of the Pripyat marches. So that's currently where the Germans believe the next Soviet offensive will be. But the Soviets are in fact building up opposite Army Group Center from Polotsk down to Zlobin, the first Baltic and the 1st, 2nd, and 3rd Belarusian fronts this month see their troop strength go up by 60%, and they triple their strength in armor and self-propelled guns. Those are the fronts who are gonna make the offensive. This offensive is not the only offensive to go off in June. The Western Allies are launching their cross-channel invasion of France in early June, weather permitting. They actually want Joseph Stalin to launch Bagration the same day their operation begins, but he's still a skeptic, and he won't launch Bagration until after the Allies have not only launched their invasion, but gained a foothold in France. Back in early April, Soviet Deputy Chief of Staff Alexei Antonov got word from the Allies that May 31st would be the kickoff date, allowing for date adjustments because of things like weather. That's a fair amount of advance notice, and it was given to him then 
by the heads of the American and British military missions to Moscow because they thought the Soviets might be so overstretched after their winter offensives that they would not be able to regroup and build up in time to synchronize their offensive with Operation Overlord, the big France offensive. They need not have worried. At the time, Stavka was already planning summer offensives and their goal is planned to eradicate all enemy forces still on Soviet soil or what they think to be Soviet soil. Other nations might disagree. Those operations began with clearing the Crimea, which they finished doing a couple weeks ago. Before the attacks against Army Group Center go off, however, the new offensives will begin with attacks against the Finns. The Leningrad Front and the Karelian Front are going to launch attacks to try to knock Finland out of the war. The Soviet command worked feverishly to keep its plans and planning absolutely secret, essential if the Belarusian attack was to come as a surprise to the German army. The full outline of the summer campaign was kept within the circle of five men only. All telephone and telegraph traffic was rigorously controlled. At front command, the smallest possible number of officers worked on operational plans, and all the draft orders were written out by hand. The political administrations with fronts and armies received orders to lay on defensive ideas thick. Signal centers closed down their big transmitters and formations used only low power sets, none of which must be located within 20 to 30 miles of the front line. There are even a couple of fronts that are to convince the enemy the main attack is to come elsewhere. Back on May 3rd, 3rd Baltic in the north and 3rd Ukrainian front in the south got orders that they are to make concentrations of troops that look like they're going to launch offensives the 5th to the 15th of June. This will hopefully tie down any and all Axis forces that would come to help Army Group Center until it's too late. I'll go over the actual strategic plans in more and more detail over the coming weeks. But already now, Soviet command sees a possible flaw. For one thing, new reports indicate the Germans have more strength remaining than they believed. And 3rd Baltic seems likely too weak to hold off Army Group North from reinforcing to the South should they be required to do so. But for another, there are issues with trying to encircle and destroy an enemy. As in, they decide that's not what they're gonna do. Well, except for Vitebsk, which is already nearly in such a position. Instead, they'll concentrate what they'll call artillery breakthrough divisions with the fronts and masses of air power since the guiding principle of the operation is to actually destroy a big part of German fighting strength, to physically destroy it. The need to pin down and wipe out German troops in the tactical defense zone to wreak the greatest possible havoc here arose from the supposed difficulties of encirclement operation. Analysis of past Soviet experience at Stalingrad and in other operations confirmed that the actual encirclement and subsequent destruction of enemy troops on a major scale demanded no small amount of time. In Belorussia, the German command could use time to bring up reserves and could rely on the terrain with its bogs and thick woods. The problem for the Soviet command therefore involved not only smashing German divisions as they stood in their defensive positions, but also preventing surviving ones from fleeing to the abundant protection provided by the Belarusian swamp and forest. Stalin and his commanders hold a battle conference this week on the 22nd and 23rd, during which the general staff plan is presented and they discuss the destruction of the main force of Army Group Center east of Minsk. Operation Bagration will begin with simultaneous attacks on the flanks around Vitebsk and Bobruisk and also hitting Mogilev. After that, the road to Minsk will be open, and with 1st Baltic swinging round west of Minsk, any escape route will be cut, and Army Group North will be effectively screened off, which would solve any issues of anyone being strong enough or not to tie them down. This is currently planned to go off sometime between the 15th and 20th of June. As for operations in the south that are also to go off, there are changes in front commands to prepare for this. Ivan Konyev takes over 1st Ukrainian front, Rodion Malinovsky takes over 2nd Ukrainian, and Fyodor Tolbukhin 3rd. 4th has been dissolved and its troops sent from the Crimea to join 1st and 2nd. As for the cross-channel invasion, 
The preparations are in motion. On the 21st, the Allies launched Operation Chattanooga Choo Choo, which is a systematic attack on the railways of Western Europe, on the engines and the rolling stock. This, of course, is to prevent the smooth transport of reinforcements during the offensive. This operation is successful enough that many German municipalities are soon asking for slave labor and even Jews from the camps to help repair the damage. The secrecy of Operation Overlord is also paramount. Where it will happen, when it will happen, what it hopes to achieve. In fact, on the 23rd, an American officer in an army postal unit tells the D-Day objectives of the U.S. First Army to someone in the adjutant general's department who's not in the loop. He is sentenced to hard labor for a year in a U.S. disciplinary barracks to be followed by dismissal from military service. An intel decrypt the 25th of a Luftwaffe Enigma message says that the Germans expect the invasion to come in the Dieppe area and that it was the bombing of the Seine River bridges again and again that led to that conclusion. However, decrypts the last few days of the week show that the Germans are suddenly transferring a lot of men to the Cotentin Peninsula which is where the Americans are going to make their attacks. In fact, the men are being sent to La Haye du Puy, which is where they plan to parachute in men to protect the men plan to arrive at what they call Utah Beach at the east of the peninsula. So today, the Americans abandon the plan to drop men just there and push back the date for the capture of Cherbourg, their objective, by seven days. There is a ton involved in the planning and build up to D-Day. And while I cover some of it here, it is all covered in great depth on our D-Day 24-hour series, which has its own channel and where the whole show comes out hour by hour on June 6. But we'll also come out here in two 12-hour episodes. You will not want to miss that. There is a link in the description, there is a link in the description, excuse me, to that channel. There are actually some American operations happening this week at the other end of the world. On the 21st, US engineers reopened the airfield at Wakde. Today, the 27th, Operation Horlick begins, which is American landings on Biak Island, a major Japanese airbase. They land near Bosnek. There is little resistance, but this could prove misleading because the Japanese have over 10,000 men there, which is not much fewer than the attacking force. And here I will end this week. A week of action in Italy as the Allies break out from Anzio. But an awful lot of action in the Far East at Kohima, Impal, Luoyang, Biak Island, and Burma. And an awful lot of plans being made for some awfully big offensives soon to come. There's also this. One last little note I'll leave you with today. The Nazi authorities are hastily deporting every Jew they can find in Hungary, Italy, France, Greece, wherever, to Auschwitz. A few thousand a day at this point. See, there are those in German high command who no longer think the war winnable. On the 24th, Reich Propaganda Minister Joseph Goebbels says in a newspaper editorial, Germany must be made more desolate than the Sahara. So to leave nothing for the Allies to plunder if and when they invade Germany. But it's obvious from the daily trains to Auschwitz that if he and others do not believe they can win the war against the Allies, they do perhaps still think they can win the war against the Jews. Well, whoever wins the world war, we'll be here to cover it week by week until, until it ends. Thanks to the Time Ghost Army. And you can be part of this by joining the army at patreon.com or timeghost.tv. These are the newest officers in the army and the Time Ghost Army member of the week is Ted Kempster. Hey, I've talked a lot about the fighting in India lately. If you wanna see more about the Indian situation and how it developed, check out this episode we did about it on Between Two Wars. It's very good. And do not forget to subscribe, subscribe. I'll see you next time.